we ought to be collectively thinking about our strategy for responding to the pandemic, including the governance issues of response. So winter brought us urgent problems. In the first instance, a health problem, a new virus with great infectiousness, uh, pretty high fatality rate, so potential for significant numbers of deaths, two to three million, potential for overwhelmed health infrastructure, and then underlying health inequities and disparities that mean that this country is likely to end up with a higher infection fatality rate than other developed democratic market economy countries. A need for immediate response led to nationwide stay-at-home advisories, but that of course brought us an economics problem. In democracies, we face a different sets of problems that relate to democratic governance specifically. And when we entered into this crisis, as of January, it was already the case that only about 30% of millennials considered essential to live in a democracy, whereas that figure for those born before World War II is at about 70%. In other words, the country has been living through a silent legitimacy crisis for some time. When the pandemic hit, it hit a democracy that already had a lot of skepticism um, in its population about whether a democracy could deliver the things that people need. Then you end up with a very important question about the role of democracies in handling and meeting crises of this kind. And so to answer that question, I think one actually has to think a little more precisely and deeply about specifically what the job of a democracy is in the face of a crisis of this kind. The first thing is that there's a need for integrative policy making and judgment. What expertise does is just advise elected leaders on judgments about how to integrate our overarching objectives. You also need public education, and by this I don't mean K-12 schooling, I mean the fact that the public needs to be broadly educated about what questions for judgment actually face decision makers. In our context, the overarching goal is that we're trying to achieve a healthy social contract that protects negative and positive liberties, and also a healthy social contract that protects social rights, social equality, and non-discrimination. So these four features of democracy come together in the need for governance via the creation of common purpose. Uh, my colleagues and I here at Harvard did pull together a big network seeking to achieve an integrated answer to the question of what our COVID-19 response should be. And again, the first elements to integrate were the public health and medical perspectives and the economic perspectives. Public health had this powerful tool for shutting down the disease, collective national quarantine, but that tool also shuts down the economy. Similarly, economists, um, sort of in economics departments in particular, took as given that there was one public health tool for addressing the pandemic. And they just asked the question, well, you know, given this economic shock, you know, how how can we try to tie the economy over? So both sides were sort of working in lanes rather than integrating the question to ask, is there a way to develop a tool for responding to the pandemic and suppressing the disease that requires us to motivate and activate the economy in order to deliver that? And that was really the integration that we needed and that this group sought. So when everything hit in February, there were two paradigms initially um, mooted, um, put on the table, a paradigm that my colleagues and I started calling surrender. This was the herd immunity strategy. And the idea you just left the disease run and lose millions of lives. And this was presented as the most economically beneficial one to keep the economy open. In fact, it was actually the most costly. The second strategy mooted was that you use collective national quarantine to shut down the disease. You, in the meanwhile, try to tie the economy over with stimulus and the like. Uh, this is also a very expensive strategy. It is more or less the strategy that we have. So against that background, my colleagues and I started arguing for a third paradigm that we called mobilize and transition. The job was to mobilize the economy and transition to pandemic resilience, actually build an alternative strategy to collective national quarantine for suppressing the disease and consider that the number one job to do to achieve recompositions in the economy, to organize the supply chain, to deliver testing at scale, to address the personnel question, to deliver contact tracing at scale. And so that led us to develop a program that we call testing, tracing, and supported isolation as that uh, approach for disease suppression um, that permits you to keep the economy open. So the first way we might think about the COVID disease is that we should have mainly a therapeutic response to it. We should just get ready to treat anybody who's symptomatic and make sure we have sufficient hospital capacity. Second purpose might, that we might have would be that we would, we would do that, we would treat people, but we, we would also try to mitigate the disease. We would try to keep it from spreading quite as quickly as it would if we left it completely unresponded to. And so our stay at home advisories are an effort to mitigate the spread of the disease. A third purpose we would have would be an effort to actually suppress the disease, to take it to such low levels that there's no longer a question of wide community spread. Of these, the third is also the best path for the economy. So all three are in some sense viable health strategies. The third is the only one that can open the economy safely and keep it open. It actually saves the most lives. It protects liberties by virtue of getting rid of the need for collective stay at home orders that interfere 
interfere with people's right of association and mobility. And in dollar terms, it's the least costly and the most supportive. That was basically the argument of our roadmap to pandemic resilience. And it, again, the basic concept is that the situation when we all started was that there was limited testing. We just used shelter in place as our tool of disease control, and there was no contact tracing. And that where we want to get is extensive testing, case isolation of COVID positive people, and respectful warning of contacts so that they know to get tested. So what's next? Local action and congressional support are the key next steps that we need. States really need a testing, tracing, and supported isolation task force at the state level. What's happening in a lot of state governments is that there's a testing task force that just focuses on tests only and kind of getting data. And there's a task force that focuses on contact tracing as a separate pillar, not connected. And there's another task force that focuses on the economy and questions of the supply chain. But the only way to build a program that's doing diagnostic testing and contact tracing and connecting people to treatment and supported isolation so they're not continuing to circulate if they're infectious is if you actually coordinate across those silos. It's another perfect example of where we need integrated policymaking, but we don't have it. So really every governor should have a full TTSI task force that's integrating across the policy silos. With regard to metrics, we should be making sure that for every COVID positive test, there are 25 further tests done with individuals directed to testing via contact tracing. This is a picture of the kind of integrated policy um, that can emerge when you start by asking the question of how do we preserve all of our objectives, saving lives, saving liberties, saving livelihoods simultaneously. If we start with the premise that we wanna do all those things, what's the solution? In our group, our view was that this was the solution. So I present this to you as a model for how democratic governance and policy development can function in the context of a crisis.